And welcome everyone to another Smart Money Circle show. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Jason L. Smith, who's the CEO and founder of C2P and JL Smith with approximately 3.2 billion in AUM. Jason is also the author of the Bucket Plan book, which has sold over 50,000 copies. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the Smart Money Circle. Thank you, Adam. Pleasure to be here. So Jason, I always like to begin. Can you tell us a little about your story and how you got to where you are today, please? Uh, sure, Adam. So um, I am the youngest of 11 children. Wow. And, yeah, and uh, I grew up in a little farm town outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And my dad uh, was an insurance agent. Um, rest his soul. He passed away uh, almost three years ago now. And, um, you know, growing up uh, as the son of an insurance agent, um, I saw um, multiple of my brothers and sisters come in and out of the business. And uh, I swore to myself I would never be an insurance agent. Uh, I was dead set on being an NBA basketball player. So um, that is <laughs> that was what was my life's mission, you know, through my young uh, younger part of my life. And then fast forward to um, uh, my senior year. And uh, had some colleges willing to uh, have me come play for free. And then wow. I blew out my ankle and I had no colleges willing to let me come uh, attend their schools for free um, by playing basketball anymore. So at that point, at 19 years old, um, in my infinite wisdom, decided, hey, why not become an insurance agent? <laughs> and so I started out. Uh, <laughs> so I wasn't expecting that. I thought you were going to go in a different direction, but keep going. Yeah. <laughs> right. The thing I swore I'd never do, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, so I started selling insurance door to door uh, for my dad's insurance agency. And, you know, as I mentioned, youngest of 11 kids, my um, dad had tried to pass the business down to my brothers and sisters and uh, unsuccessfully. Eventually, he gave it to my uncle. And the year I came in was actually the year my dad was retiring. Oh, wow. And if you can imagine 11 kids, right? He was tired. He was tired. And that's why he needed to retire. And um, my uncle, the uncle had taken it over. And man, I was just full of piss and vinegar. And I was rocking the boat. And my dad was like, you're fired. <laughs> like, you need to go figure this out on your own. You know, you're rocking the boat. Your uncle took over the business. So, um at that point, I, you know, I've always been a big learner and reader, like a passion for learning. And, um, and that's what I did. You know, I was really self-taught. I didn't end up going back to college, um, just really self-taught in, in embracing this business. I worked with a law firm for a number of years and, and learned a lot about estate planning and doing their insurance part of it. Eventually I ended up opening up a tax, uh, planning and preparation firm uh, right. that we still have today, then got my investment license and continued to just study, be really be a student of the great game of business. And uh, fast forward to, uh, to where we're at today, I have um, C2P, which is a, a, a handful of companies that um, supports uh, holistic wealth management um, entrepreneurs in this business, and we help them uh, in their business. Uh, we manage money for them, and we uh, provide insurance solutions and help them with training, coaching, all that good stuff. And then I also have my own holistic wealth management practice, JL Smith, that uh, we help you know clients all around the country and have offices uh, at a handful of locations around the country. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at today. I Fun fact, it. two sets of twins, twin six-year-olds, twin eight-year-olds, and you met my 26-year-old uh, a little bit ago, Adam, who set up the Zoom that works with us here. Wow, that is a great story. <laughs> I get the first one with dual sets of twins. So let's talk about the book, the Bucket Plan book. Congrats on selling over 50,000 copies. My book was number one on Amazon, and I know how good that feels to really get it out there. So um, can you just give us the basics on the book and educate people a little bit on what you do and, and your investment strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Adam, the book is so much about behavioral finance, right? And it's really around, uh, there's a concept called bucketing that some of the listeners may be familiar with. 
And this concept has been around for quite some time. The earliest, you know, kind of uh, ties back to kind of the godfather of bucketing of the concept is Harold Dubinsky out of Texas Tech, who's also a financial planner and a professor at Texas Tech. And uh, he was the first one who talked about this kind of idea of time segmenting money based on the purpose and the time horizon of when you'll need to access those funds. And one of the biggest reasons to do that is a behavioral finance component of it, right? Like having that money where you stay the course, you set your goals, you know, with that uh, certain block of money and you're not reactive based on what's going on in the market or the economy or whatever, you kind of stay the course. So it helps you do that. You know, it helps curb bad behavior. Really, I like to say it cuts out freak out risk, right? Because sometimes like people yeah. freak out, right? When the market um, does some crazy things and they make bad decisions, where if you um, if you time segment and compartmentalize your money based on the purpose <laughs> and the time horizon of when you're ne going to need to access those funds, you know, it can really give you the confidence to stay the course, right? And so um, this concept's been around for a long time. There's four bucket, five bucket, seven bucket, three bucket approaches. We, um, our approach is a three bucket approach. Now, soon and later is the bucket plan. And so we take, took this concept and then we built a holistic wealth management process around it. So a step-by-step -step process that we take a prospective or current client through to ultimately land at having their own customized bucket plan with all of their assets, incorporating all of the insurance, investment, um, estate planning, and tax planning and management strategies and solutions within the plan. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking something very sophisticated and simplifying it with this three bucket approach and applying a process to ultimately get to that final goal, you know, that the clients um, are, are des desiring. I love that. And I've taken notes as you, as you speak. So there's the bucket plan. So you want to do, can you talk about time segmenting and just let the audience know what that means and, and in a practical standpoint? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the easiest way to think about it is, you know, if you can, you know, and, and this is fun too, Adam, like I've been doing this probably 25 years, this this concept of the time segmenting way before I, I'd ever heard of Harold Dubinsky or others that were doing bucketing. And I, but I did it, it were boxes is what they were. So what I used to do is I would draw boxes on a notepad or if I was in someone's house or at their business or a dry erase board, and it would be three boxes. Mm -hmm. And I would talk to them about there's now money, which is more of your safe and liquid money. It's your emergency fund. It's planned expenses that were within the next few years, roof on the house, redo in the kitchen, whatever those things might be. And um, it's the money that basically we all have a magic number, a certain amount of money that we can put our head on the pillow at night and sleep soundly if we have that amount of money set aside. We're not worried about the rate of return necessarily. We want the safety and the liquidity, right, of that money to know it's there. So that's the now bucket. Then from there, it's it's two buckets. And again, back then it was boxes. So the soon was the money that was more conservatively invested. So we could confidently take income or withdrawals from it without worrying about the ups and downs of the market or the fluctuations or tying that money up or, you know, those kind of things. If the market's down, oh, I don't want to sell, you know, so you have the confidence to be able to take income or withdrawals. So that's the that's that middle uh, box, right? And then the third was long-term growth and legacy planning. That's where you can commit to the long haul to make the, you know, make the decisions to take on more risk or more volatility to yep. get the best possible rate of return. And that's where we can do tax planning strategies to really prepare for the surviving spouse and the next generation to pay the least amount of taxes and have, have things go smoothly. But, you know, Adam, it started out as boxes and the thing was, is like, I would write people's assets and I'd write now, soon and later above the three boxes and I'd document, you know, I'd 
write their dollar amounts and what accounts went in each three. And we'd counsel through how much money that we should have now and then soon invested conservatively and then later more invested for growth and maybe being passed on to surviving spouse and beneficiaries or charities or whatever it might be. And that's how we talk about it. Well, I would total up the dollar amounts on top of each of the three boxes. And for whatever reason, I was sitting there with Glenn and Judy. I remember I know exactly who it was and the time it happened. And I put the totals above each of the three boxes. For whatever reason that day, I circled each of the three totals. Well, if you can envision this in your head, like Glenn says to me, hey, those look like buckets. Oh, and nice. like, you know, I've always had a bucket list, but I've never had a bucket plan. Right. I um, like, right. So I go home, I tell my wife about it. Yeah. She goes and gets the trademark for the bucket plan and those that visual of the three. And then long story short, you know, the process and the book was written, which is a true story about clients that we took through the process. And then unfortunately, he had a, a tragic and un, untimely death about a year after we took we built their bucket plan. And it was just, it's a great story of how, you know, the what surviving what, you know, spouse, the wife, her name is Irene, were able, was able to, um, you know, basically live out the rest of her life the way she was accustomed to and never have to worry about, you know, money or those things because of the bucket plan we had in place. Yeah, I love that. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing. So let's talk about risk management. What are, how do you handle risk? And then what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm going to tie it right back a little bit to what we were just talking about just a moment ago, the freak out risk, right? That is one of the biggest mistakes I see. I think too often people have a now bucket, right? It's their money in the bank, right? And then they have, and maybe they have not enough, right? So, so they're not as comfortable because maybe um, they have too much invested, right, with their financial advisor. They should probably set aside some more um, to give them that true comfort. And this, no number is the exact right number. It's very individualized to that person of what is going to give them peace of mind, right, and, and give, give them that comfort level. But often people have a now bucket, usually, almost, always do, right? And then they, all the rest of the money is invested as if it's a later bucket. And, the, and I think the mistake people make is they don't set up a soon bucket. Mm -hmm. And there's, and I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about two different groups of people that I see often that make this mistake. You have people that are like within 10 years from retirement or even already retired, kind of going into that or about to go into that distribution phase of their life right. where they start distributing money from the assets they've accumulated mm -hmm. and they're still invested all in accumulation. Right. They've never preserved a portion of their assets in a soon bucket, in that middle bucket. And that's the mistake they make. And sometimes they make bad decisions or sometimes they just are susceptible to risk they shouldn't have been because they, they have a downturn in the market. They need the money. They sell it when the market's down and they can never make that money back. Right. They're not there for the recovery. Yeah. And um, they're worried now because they have a TikTok on their time horizon where they didn't have that maybe 20 or 30 years ago. So then when the bear market comes, they get scared, they freak out, which I love, by the way. And then, bam, they sell it at the wrong time. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah. You yeah. know, because you and Adam, you know this, like there's a money cycle that we all go through throughout our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And there's three phases to the money cycle. Um, accumulation, preservation and distribution. And in the accumulation phase, you're younger, you're working, you know, you're long ways out from retirement. You're not worried about preservation. You're just, you know, you're growing and your money's all invested for growth. You have a little emergency fund, but the rest of it all is later bucket, basically. But then as you start to enter 10 years or less out from retirement, you know, you start going into more of a preservation phase where you want to preserve a portion of the assets that you're gonna draw off of first in retirement. And that's in preparation for that third and final phase, which is distribution. Distribution to yourself in retirement, distribution to your family upon your passing. And the biggest mistake that I see people make is they go directly from accumulation to distribution and they never preserve a portion of their assets to draw from, from in the first phase. 
So I, that was going to be not my next question, but the one after. What are some timeless mistakes you see people make? And that's that is the biggest mistake you see people make so frequently. I, I think so. And you know what, Adam, the second group too that I think you know I see like that that really needs to think about this, right? Is like the younger people that are a ways out, mm -hmm. and they're like, well, I don't, I I have a now bucket, right? I have an emergency fund. The rest, I'm all invested for growth because, like, I'm in it for the long haul. But some of those people might be entrepreneurs, or some of those people might have an entrepreneurial spirit and might decide they want to be entrepreneurs, or some of those people might decide they want to buy a vacation home somewhere, right? In in the warm weather, or you know, opportunities can come up, and if you have a minimal amount of money in the now bucket, which most people are going to have just enough, right? For, for sleep insurance, right? And the rest of the money is all for growth. What that soon bucket becomes for younger people, entrepreneurs, business owners, is it's an opportunity bucket, right? Because you want to invest a certain amount of money yeah. to outpace inflation and right. to do well, but not take on the full risk Right. of like being fully in the market like you would be in the later bucket. So that soon bucket becomes more of an opportunity bucket. Makes perfect sense. And then how about some timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think like timeless lessons, even from, I guess, my own situation and working with clients the last, you know, 25, 28 years, whatever it's been now since 1995. Um and uh, I mean, I think like, I'm going to go back to the mistake thing, right? Um, not, not, you know, the biggest mistake we talked about, but the other common mistake I think I see people make is they dump all the money they can into pre-tax accounts, right? And they overfund, and you know, you probably talk about this all the time. So I'm just like preaching to the choir. No, but no, they, no. I, I know it personally, but the audience would love to hear this. So keep it coming. You're doing, you're doing okay, a great, great job. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. And so they overfund um, pre-tax accounts, like similar, you know, think of your money when it becomes to, let's switch gears, talk about taxes now. We were talking about mm -hmm. risk. Yeah. Right. I'm segmenting based on the purpose and the time horizon. I'm going to also three use three funnels now, if you can envision in your head instead of three buckets, because at the end of the day, you got to use these funnels to fill the buckets. And then when you go into that's in the accumulation phase, you want to be strategic of how you're filling your buckets. And so you're going to drop a certain amount of money year in and year out through these funnels to fill the buckets. But then when you go into the distribution phase, you're going to be drawing from the buckets, turning on the spigot for each one of these funnels to draw money out to keep yourself in the lowest possible tax bracket. Right. And there's a strategy to that. And, but I think the mistake that I see too often that people make is they just default to putting all their money into 401ks and IRAs and thrift savings plans and 403bs that are all pre-tax. So when I say pre-tax, also known as tax qualified, you know, these type of accounts are where you're deferring the tax liability. You're paying no tax before you put the money in, even mm -hmm. though you earn that income, you're deferring, right? You're putting that money in yeah. and then it all goes tax deferred and then you take it out and it's taxable, you know, an ordinary income when you take it out. That's the first funnel, if you will. Remember there's three, so there's pre-tax. The second funnel is post-tax. So that's the money that like, again, you earned the income, but you went ahead and paid your tax on it. And now the money's free and clear and it's yours. And then if you invest that money, yes, you're going to pay tax on the interest or the growth, but the principal is all tax free, right? Gives you a lot more flexibility to move the money around, make decisions, buy a vacation home, renovate a kitchen, not worried about all the tax liability, et cetera. Right. The third funnel is going to be your tax free money or my compliance department would prefer me to say tax favored money, right? Like and that. so- you know, and that third funnel is going to be money like Roth money, right? Or muni bonds 
or even if you have cash value in life insurance that you can take loans from and all be tax free or the death benefit taxes uh, passes tax free. Um, HSAs, right, or flexible savings accounts. These are some examples of tax free funds. And Adam, I think that too often people just pile all their later bucket money uh, and most all the, their money, 80, 90% of it, all goes into the pre-tax funnel. Right. Then they have a little bit of money, maybe 10% of it that goes in the post-tax funnel. Mm -hmm. And then it's like an afterthought where they maybe get a little bit of money, maybe some Roth accounts that they put five, six grand a year or whatever it is into the tax-free. And it's not balanced. And yeah. then so in the accumulation phase, they don't fill the tax-free funnel appropriately. Mm -hmm. They don't fill the tax, the post-tax funnel up appropriately. And then they have way too much weighted and pre-tax. And then when they go into distribution, yeah, exactly. they don't have a choice but to only draw from that one. And then they trigger undue tax on Social Security, bump themselves up into the higher bracket when they could have stayed in the lower one, et cetera. Makes perfect sense. So next question for you. Um, what about some, you see a lot of, you work with people, you have the multiple levels, you've got the financial advisors, you've got the tax side of it. Do you still do the insurance side as well? Yes. You still yeah. do. Okay. So you got the insurance, you got the wealth management, you've got the whole, um, the holistic approach, if you will. What are some, I guess, timeless mistakes? Not that the people make, but the actual advisors that you work with, I guess, good and bad. So good things that they do to thrive and then some mistakes that they do. If you speak to the advisors a little bit and the audience can learn whether they're advisors or the clients of the advisors on, on how people who manage money, let's put our, that hat on a little bit. And what are some mistakes and good things that those, you know, those folks do? Yeah. And, you know, Adam, I think that, you know, when you go back in time, and you look at, you know, in reference to like this holistic wealth management, like what is that? What are we talking about there? Mm -hmm. And so let, we'll, we'll take a moment just to kind of define that a little further. And I think that when you go back in time, the ultra high net worth have gotten this forever, right? And so it's a family office, right? Mm -hmm. It's where, you know, there's, you know, there, there's people seated at the table that are coordinating the tax planning and management year in and year out with the investment management, with the insurance solutions, with the attorney doing the estate planning, and it's all coordinated together into one holistic plan, right? One comprehensive holistic plan. So the ultra high net worth have gotten this for decades, but I feel like that level below ultra high net worth, the hardworking, American families, the entrepreneurs, you know, the salt of the earth, like those people that have really accumulated their own funds, they've made their own way, they didn't inherit tens of millions of dollars, they went out there and they earned it. And they're overlooked in many cases, and they're primarily served by a lot of salespeople. Mm -hmm. And when I say salespeople, I'm talking about the investment salespeople that are just selling stocks, bonds, and mutual mm -hmm. funds to try to get you to invest with them insurance people trying to sell their uh, annuities and life insurance and long-term care. They're sold by uh, tax people that are selling the tax returns and accounting service and the attorneys selling trusts and wills. And they're all working in silos and they're not communicating and they're not collaborating with each other. Right. And so I think like as a fiduciary financial advisor, right? As a holistic wealth manager, if that's what you are, if that's what you do, or if you're a client of one of these, like there's a responsibility of tying all this together, of connecting the dots. There needs to be constant communication, especially between the tax professional, because like if you think about tax, let's talk about tax planning versus tax management versus right. tax preparation, right? right? Yeah. Tax, let, let's use a house analogy. That's a real simple way to understand. Tax planning is kind of like hiring the architect to build the blueprint for the house that you want, okay. right? That's tax planning. Tax management is actually building and maintaining the house. 
And then the tax preparation is the building inspector coming in and signing off on the good work that's done. Got it. Too often people are just getting tax preparation and they're not getting the tax planning and management. And the management needs to happen every year, year in and year out, needs to be in court, coordinated with the investment and the insurance professionals and the attorney. And I think like it's just missed, you know, for a huge segment of people that have millions of dollars and make really good income and they're not getting that level of coordination that they need. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. So I guess final question for you today is what would the best piece of advice you'd like to give the audience be and or your 30 year old self? Great. Um, yeah, the best piece of advice I would say is like, um, Number one, find a professional, work with a professional that's tying it all together. Like if you love your investment guy and your insurance guy, then pay out of pocket to somebody else to coordinate all this if they don't have that capability. The other thing I would say is fill that tax refunnel. Look for ways to get money into HSAs, Roth IRAs. There's something you can look up called a back. We don't have time to talk about it, but Roth 401k, you can do a mega backdoor Roth conversion where there's the ability to get a bunch more money even uh, depending on what plan you're in at your employer. Uh, you can get a ton more money into a backdoor uh, Roth conversion, a mega backdoor 401k Roth conversion. Like there's ways to just get money into forever tax-free status, right? Look at life insurance of, you know, building up cash value accumulation. You know, there's, there's in really in that order, I think HSAs are the best thing. There's nothing better, right? Then Roth IRAs and then cash value life insurance really look to try to fill that funnel, that tax-free funnel, because it's going to serve you really well in retirement. And it's especially going to serve your family, your surviving spouse and your, your kids and grandkids and, you know, upon your passing. No, it makes perfect sense. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak today. What is the best way for people to learn more about you, what you do or your service, get in touch with you, anything along those lines? Yeah, so I think the bucket plan book is on Amazon. That is a great first step if you really want to understand, you know, how this works even more. And uh, jlsmithgroup.com is our website. Uh, and uh, there's a link on there where you can book a free consultation if you want to talk a little bit more and ask specific questions to your uh, individual situation. Beautiful. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time and hopefully we'll have you on again soon. This was great. All right. Thank you, Adam.